Hello and welcome back to a special episode of Stab Mike. I'm Ashton Goggins, Stab's Editor-in-Chief, and on today's show is the WSL CEO Eric Logan speaking with Sam McIntosh. Sam and Eric spoke on the eve of the announcement that came today that the WSL is proposing broad and sweeping changes to the structure and direction of their tour. There's been rumors of some of these shifts coming for a few years now, and as Sam says, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And I think the WSL is being pretty forward-thinking, using this period to define the next evolution of the tour. Without further ado, here's Sam and Eric. Enjoy. You've been busy. Yeah, sure. Um, So, listen, we've uh, made a couple really substantial announcements today. Um, uh, I would say there's four really big vectors. We've got an announcement on the 2020 tour. Um, We've got an announcement on um, how we want to crown our men and women world champions on the CT tour prospectively uh, down uh, in the future in 2021. Uh, Some modifications to the seasonality of the Challenger series and then this reintroduction of regional tours and domestic tours. So, um, you know, I I, I kind of defer to you, bud, sort of like spin the wheel. Where do you want to sort of start? Like Wheel of Fortune, the, the stab wheel of meat. Well, I absolutely want to start with the crowning of the world champ because I think that is the, I guess that's the most tectonic shift. And I think that is the most exciting part. So can you talk us through crowning the world champ in 2021? Yeah, so, you know, this, um, Patchy's really great about, about talking about this is a bit of a new old idea um, that's been around for a while. It started, pre- it predates me joining the WSL. Um, it started uh, about three years ago. Uh, and there was a lot of discussion about what a surf off would look like. Um, so there was a lot of conversations that happened, a lot of meetings that happened. The surfers approved the idea over three years ago. And then just through a variety of starts and stops and just uh, challenges, frankly, um, really couldn't get it over the line. And, and what really was interesting was having been at the WSL now over a year, obviously running the studio side of the business, when I became CEO, in the first part of January, one of the first things I said to Pat was, we have to figure out how to really create these world championship moments. And that's really what I'm aiming to do, which, and, and the reason why was because we just sat through it watching what happened at Pipeline with Italo and Gabrielle. And it was just, it was riveting. And anybody who was a surf fan, you know, they talk about it and the numbers proved out. I mean, it was one of the most watched heats uh, in the history of our, of our sport. Um, and it just was this galvanizing thing. It's like, there's that world championship moment that the sports have. And, you know, we just don't always have it. And so we're like, you know, let's, let's make that, let's make that something what we do in 2022. So we start, you know, do our normal tour planning as always. And, and on March uh, 11th, I'll never forget. I was driving down to a meeting in Solana beach and a friend of mine who is the, um, president of the Los Angeles Clippers, who's a really good friend of mine, had called me and said, hey, um, the NBA is going to suspend the season. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And that was the night that Rudy Gobert got tested positive. Um, And I think within the same 24-hour period or something closely thereafter, Tom Hanks and, and Rita got you know, COVID positive, and they happened to be actually in the Gold Coast where we were heading literally in two weeks. And I was like, oh man, this this is starting to spin it. And then it was just a, a, a blur. And before you know it, we were suspending, you know, our tours. And that was a crazy time period. So this discussion of the World Championship got put off to the side. But once we sort of kind of got through how we were going to handle the tour, you know, to start the tour, certainly with the Australian leg, it really became more apparent as we were starting to work on this that well wait a minute we've got this hold and we don't really know when we're going to be able to surf again and travel internationally let's 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 talk about this some more and and get people on the phone so we started having more conversations and then it just became even more apparent that in addition to just this challenge there are other things about the other parts of the tours that we've always wanted to sort of address holistically and so we were like okay I started asking ourselves, what is the type of organization we want to be on the other side of COVID? How do we best use this opportunity to really accelerate our thinking, innovate, and really drive some meaningful change forward? And the more we talked, the more we said, you know what? Why are we waiting in 2022? Let's let's bring that forward. And so we did. So so I would tell you the, the first two or three decisions, Sam, were really in and around 
the, the acceleration of the thinking and started to reconnect a bit about those conversations we had a few years ago. Yeah, and so to go back to one of your points in there about the numbers around Italo versus Gabe at the Pipe Masters last year, yeah, which is just an outstanding sporting moment to watch. Yep. How did that compare to the numbers on, which I think is equally as compelling as an event to view, was the John Kelly, Gabriella uh, Chopu? Yeah. I believe it was 2016. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the difference with this is that our, our linear distribution, in addition to our digital distribution, is at an all-time high. I mean, we've got great distribution in the United States with Fox. We got great distribution in Australia um, with Fox. Um, so when we start looking at the reach that we had with a distribution perspective, it really sort of dwarfed anything that we'd ever seen. Um, just because you're a bigger engine now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just a byproduct, right. a byproduct of that we, our distribution modalities are better. Um, you know, pipe for pipe, um, year over year, here's a directionally was up around 28% year over year. So if you just sort of look at like pipe last year versus pipe or last or two years ago, I guess it would be in 2018 versus 19, it was up over 28%. So um, it was just so meaningful. And it also, you know, you, you saw that intangible residue that sort of permeates our sport with just everywhere it went, everybody was talking about it. And it just was one of those great defining moments that we'll all talk about, just like that heat there, just like, you know, any other heats that you can come up with, this one's going to go down in the history books and the angles of one of the most memorable ones. And my sense is if it wasn't two guys battling out from the same country, it would have even been larger, like the would, size of that audience. Yeah. So and so I, I think it's, I think it's a clever strategy to put this, to go and engineer this for the future, as opposed to hoping it happens again, or you get that. It's, it's hard to have that world title showdown on the final day, let alone in a final. So, uh, yeah, and, you know, and what's what's so interesting about that, and you know this too, and I think all of your listeners know it, there was a really, I don't want to say really good shot, but there was a pretty good shot that um, uh, Gabriel could have closed it out in Portugal. You know, he had a shot to close out the title in Portugal. And obviously we, there was the interference call and all the things that happened that really allowed it to, ha to this to happen. We didn't, <clears throat> and here's another interesting point too, just like, you know, again, pick your, pick your world championship, whether it's, you know, the NFL or whatever it would be, you, you know that that's going to happen. You know that there's going to be a crowning moment. Um, whether or not, you know, it's a day before, two days before, whatever it would be, you certainly know what it, what it is. In our case, we only had like, we knew there was an idea that it could happen a couple hours beforehand, but it really wasn't until like 90 minutes to an hour before that we knew we had a world championship heat. So we couldn't even really leverage that from a marketing and audience growth perspective. So, you know, I'm going to turn around telling those human stories in 90 minutes. Yeah, sure. There's no way to do it. Right. And, yeah. so, and so when we think about how we can elevate that moment for our women and our men, both, how to, you know, how you can take that and, and really leverage that from a media perspective, from a sponsorship perspective, from a fan perspective, really, really gets your juices going. It's sort of like, okay, that can be sort of like the moment. Um, there is a lot to figure out, you know, in how to get to that moment, which I know we'll get to here in a second, which, but that's the fun part. You know, I think that's the fun part. And I think it also speaks to why we're sort of announcing it this way, Sam, which is, you know, we're just kind of coming out saying, as I like to say with the organization, I like, we're going to the valley. We're, we're heading to the valley or we're heading over the bridge. And uh, a lot of the, I know you, I know you have many, many friends in our organization and they're like, man, Elo, he's always like, go to the valley. Not quite sure how we're going to get there yet, but we're going to the valley. And, and this is a really good example of, of that, I think, which is, I think we all agree that this could be a really powerful thing for our sport. And, you know, in collaboration with our surfers, uh, our media partners, our sponsors, and even our fans, I think it's going to be, it's, it's going to be a fun process to really harden this, this day down. And then all the questions that sort of come up out of it that we haven't quite completely got all, all the way through with, um, we can get there. I, you know, I, I, I was saying this uh, the other day, which was, you know, there's one or two ways you can do this. You can, you can 
go sit in the dark and sort of roll it all out and tell everybody it's done. Or you can kind of say, hey, this is where we think we want to head with the, the sport and the organization and sort of do it a little bit more out in the open. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bit more of a, of a guy who likes to lead transparently. I like to be very open. Um, I'm very comfortable with that. Um, I like the questions. Uh, I don't run from them. Uh, and I lean into them. So I think this is going to be a, a, a tremendous journey and a process and a lot of fun for us. Okay, so you've gone and put the caveat in that, hey, we don't have this nutted out. So I'm going to go and ask the questions you probably don't have answers to yet. <laughs> uh, I, by the way, I knew you were going to ask me. I just might as well just hand it off at the past, Sam, but go ahead. I, I, can't, I can't not. So of course. any indication on the number of surfers and the location for this event? No. Does it feel like Hawaii? No, I mean, we don't, we don't, so we, it's a great question. And it's, it's, the, it's the question everybody has. So what we've decided to do is sort of begin with the end in mind, which is, you know, we wanna, we wanna have that moment where we see the buzzer. You know, I go back to that image of Italo in the water, just his hands up in the air, he's on the inside of pipe. And, you know, he is completely mob thronged when he gets out of the water and he's, and that, that, all of that. So I go to that and go, okay, that's what we want for our men and our women. So then we start reverse engineering how we get back there. What's the right number? What, what is the weighting of the points going into it? How are you determining? Where do you want to do it? All those sort of things. So we haven't, got, we haven't gotten very far down that road. So we're starting that process with our surfers, to be really honest with you. We're starting that process with what is the right number of surfers for our men and our women. And, and again, when you start doing that, it's like, you know, you start thinking about, okay, location. Hey, good news is, you know, both for our women and our men, both of them in the existing season today in two world-class locations. I mean, you know, for the women, Honolulu is a fantastic location and obviously Pipe is the proving ground. So, you know, we're not really focusing on that piece yet. We want to make sure we get this, this surf off right. And there's still a lot of work to do on that. Yeah, and I believe uh, I did some research with Dave yet prior to the call yesterday, and he said there's been sign-off on from all the world champions. Is that correct? Yeah, we've spoken to all of them. I think they all they they all love the idea. Um, and the article that uh, hit the New York Times this morning with uh, quotes from you know Caroline and Lakey. Um, also, we had a, a World Surf Weekly drop with Tyler Wright and Connor. You know, they all in their own ways have the different vernacular of like, you know, the opportunity to win it in the arena, uh, as uh, some frame it, in the ocean, uh, as others said. It's just really powerful. And what that means as a competitor, how you have to now elevate your game. Um, they, th their words back to me through all the variety of conversations that our teams have had have all been, it's going to bring out a different level of competition for everybody. Um, I think we're going to see a different type of surfing for that. I think it's going to be exciting. Um, but yeah, I mean, our teams have talked to just about all of them. I can't confirm if we've, if we've not missed one or not. Um, obviously, they, there's a lot of questions that come up when we bring it up, like, you know, how and where, and all, the same ones that I think that everybody has. Uh, but we're really starting to get into it. And I've got all the confidence in the world in Pat and his team. Um, and the relationships that they have that we're going to be starting to knock those pins down. So we've also put a marker out there, Sam, uh, this morning that in early July, we're going to come back to the, to the larger community in the same way we did this morning uh, and share with them more information. Um, like I said, want this to be you know, open and transparent with everybody. Yeah, the negotiation that goes down with those, those top surfers about the size of the people who go to the final is going to be an interesting conversation. Because uh, be I think everyone will be leaning for a top 32. Yeah, I, yeah, they're going to be what at the whole tour, right? They're going to start yeah. off the whole thing, right? Now it's, uh, yeah, it, listen, I mean, I think the, the, the exciting part about it is, is that, you know, I, I always try, try to take a step back and look at it from, from a bit of a perspective that, you know, we're in this, we're in this COVID hold or I, I don't even know what we're going to brand this thing 10 years from now, whatever it's called pandemic life. I don't know what, what we're, what we're in right now, this weird purgatory. Um, but I think we're going to look back at this and, you know, I just want to make sure uh, as the organization that we're all challenging ourselves to really think and innovate and take the time to do what it is we've always wanted to do. I mean, oftentimes in business, and I've run a lot of different businesses, as you know, we, the, the, the consistent complaint is you don't have enough time to really stop and think and plan. And, you know, 
that excuse is not applicable today. That excuse is not true today. We've got, we've got time. So that's my, that's kind of my point. Let's get after it. So, um, but yeah, those conversations are going to be, they're going to be fun. Maybe I'll tape a few of them for you, Sam. It'll be some good content for staff. <laughs> well, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste and it just sort of, typically it tends to expedite the future. And was this a plan always aiming for 2021 or was this something further down the road that you thought, okay, cool, it's time to do this. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I you know it's a great question. I think, you know, we were talking earlier about it. It was, when I became CEO, it was so convincing to me as a surf fan that it's like, I, you know, again, I'm a fan. I mean, that's the thing. I'm a fan first, you know, and then running the organization is sort of my day job. But I look at everything from just a few, a pure fan froth point of view. You know, I just can't get enough of it. And that moment to me, I was lost in that moment. I really was. I was just, it was like, it was the fastest heat I've ever watched because I didn't want it to end. And, you know, and I've watched it a number of times since then. And so we always thought that we were going to have to do this out in 2022 for, you know, a number of reasons. And most notably, it was just going to be hard to have time to get to everybody. You know, it's going to, it's going to be a challenge to get to all the world champions, to talk to all of our sponsors, to line up all the media partners, to get them understanding a change. Um, then we, all of our governmental partnerships that we have with all the countries that, of which we have partners. All those things are going to take time. And, and I was actually talking this conversation about this with Pat yesterday. It was like, if we were trying to do this right now, we'd be in WA, either done with WA, on hold, traveling to G-Land. And it's sort of like on the other side of the planet. I mean, when are we having these four-hour conference calls? When, is the, when, when are those happening? They're just, they're just not. And it would be so glacial that eventually the inertia and momentum of the idea would sort of like just fizzle out. So, so that's kind of the reason why it's like, well, let's just do it for 2021. Let's go. Let's, I mean, why wait? I mean, I kept asking the question, why are we waiting to 22? And the reason why we were waiting to 22 was because it was going to take that long to get everybody on the same page. All right. Well, here we are. You know, I'm talking. What's thinking. <laughs> and so tell me since you so what your four months into the new role. Four months into it. Yeah. Guy, I mean, yeah. can you, by the way, can I just tell you this? It's like, <laughs> somebody said to me one time, they're like, man, congratulations. You're the CEO of a global international sports league. And now you've got a pandemic. I'm like, yeah, well, I didn't see that one coming for sure. So. <laughs> and, and how's it going? How are you guys trucking? Like, is it, is this going to be, I, I guess most of us in business at the moment are wondering how survival looks this year. How are you guys trucking as a business? Well, it's challenging, uh, for sure. Um, uh, you know, you know, our our business model is predicated today on running a championship tour and running tours, um, and we haven't, and so that creates a tremendous amount of pressure on on our business. Um, one of the things that I said early on, um, as you know, was I really believe we have a transformative moment as an organization to sort of pivot from just being a sports league into a sports media company. And a lot of the work I know that you guys saw and we've even talked about last year with how what we were doing on the studio side of our business, ramping up the studio side of the business with series and things that we were doing. And even our network shows that we sold here in the United States called Ultimate Surfer to a big network ABC here was an indication to me and the reaction and the traction that we were getting from that content really sort of codified in my mind. It's like, yeah, that's really the path that we should be on. Um, when, when, when I got an opportunity from the ownership group to take the organization and really accelerate that transformation that we were talking about, it was, it was very natural for me, given my background. And, and since then, you know, we've got thrust into this COVID situation, which really shined a big bright light on uh, on the second part of that, which is you really need to be that media organization and just try to be this large platform and tell these narratives and connect with the community. But now you need to do it like much faster. And so um, on one hand, we've got our entire tours business really being shut down. On the other hand, we're scaling up tremendously fast on the studio side. We've got a new website that you've seen, a new mobile web. We've introduced you know, countless new franchises. We've got two really, really big announcements coming in a couple of weeks in terms of more content, exclusive content deals coming. 
So we're, we're throttling that up and I don't expect that to slow down at all. And uh, the intention there is that as this media business continues to grow, we're just building this base and building this platform so that when the tours come back, it's even a bigger stage for them to be on top of. So um, I would tell you that it wasn't originally kind of what we thought. We thought we'd get the tour stood up and then we'd talk about this transformation really taking root sort of in June, candidly, uh, around the Olympics was sort of our idea. Um, sure got thrust into COVID, it was like, okay, much like we are having with this tour conversation, it's like, let's bring that forward. Let's go and hustle. And so uh, the team's done an amazing job. So I'm really excited by that. Media businesses are challenge businesses. And the pivot to that part does surprise me because it's just so hard to monetize that, that, that content to either have it sponsored, have a distribution deal. Is that part of the business making sense? Is it washing its face? Well, look, I mean, I think, you know, so if you think about it this way, um, the, the, the future of our organization, I think, is really going to be in, in three baskets. I think that the first basket is going to be what you're most familiar with, most of our fans are familiar with, which is this part of the business, which is the live entertainment business, if you will, which is the tours. So our, or our owned and operated tours, which would be the CT Tour Challenger Series, and a lot of our licensed events that we have with our QS, and as we've talked about this morning, those transferring over into um, you know, more regional and domestic tours. The media side of the business is actually, if you can get to scale, and you actually can generate the type of traffic that we believe we can, it actually is a very high gross margin lucrative business in terms of operating leverage. And here's why. Because when you start integrating two organizations together and you integrate a live event company or you integrate a sports league and you integrate that with a media company, you get, you get the leverage of both because all of a sudden they start working together. So a major part of this is really leveraging these downtimes when we're not running. What we learned last year is we put forth this thinking of, well, what happens to the site? What happens to our organization from a media perspective when we're not running our tours? Um, obviously, people drift away because, you know, if you're not running the CT tour, people's, get their, their mind moves around. That's we, your other 300 thing, right? Like that's, you exactly. spoke about last year, yeah. Exactly. So when we talk about the other 300, now what happens is now we, we tested so much stuff during that period of time and we learned enough that it gave us the confidence to say, hey, that other 300 can be pretty powerful. Uh, and we're already seeing that right now. We're seeing really great growth numbers and indices really starting to come up since we've republished our site the different, in all the different ways that we've done. But from a business perspective, that's the traffic side, but from a business perspective, the, the operating leverage that we can actually get from a gross margin basis is pretty good. The third part of our business is gonna be the studio part of the business. Um, and that obviously speaks to my background as well prior to coming to the WSL. And creating content that is off platform and creating content that we're actually selling to third party, distribu to third party, third party distribution companies can be a, a very lucrative business as well. And the reason why that's important is because that part of our engine effects, effectively becomes a little bit of a calling card. Uh, and a perfect example of that is Ultimate Surfer. Um, you know, this show being sold to ABC, which is a reality-based surf competition show in the United States will be a tremendous calling card for our overall sport of surfing and specifically um, competitive surfing. Uh, Kelly is very it's, much. It's like, oh, sorry for interrupting. It's, it's likely the most broad appeal surfing, sh surfing, I guess, property ever created, if it works. Oh, I, I think it could be. I think, I, I think I, absolutely. Um, and, and a lot of people draw parallels to Ultimate Fighter in the UFC, to Ultimate Surfer, to us. And it's a very appropriate, it's a very appropriate analogy. I mean, Ultimate Fighter really helped create, you know, a mass appeal uh, education into the UFC and MMA. And so what we think, because we can shoot it at the surf ranch, because we can actually have, you know, this reality-based, broad-based conversation happening, we've got the face of, we've got Ale Kelly, who's effectively, you know, our guru, surf expert, and they're all competing for spots on the tour, potentially. Um, it is, it can be a transcendent moment for us. So the studio part of our business is is key. So if you take a step back, Sam, and you've got these three these three elements, um, you know this is um, 
this is really about us saying to ourselves, hey, we're a media company wrapped around sports league. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm constantly surprised by the volume that, of content you guys create from the daily, uh, the daily surf breaks. No, what is it? Sorry. That's all right. No worries. Yeah, what's the daily, what is the this daily content you drop every day? Is it surf breaks? Yeah, surf breaks. Yeah, surf breaks. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm constantly perplexed by the volume of content you guys create from Lawn Patrol to surf breaks to the weekly show. And I face the same challenges. You just throw this stuff up on YouTube and it gets good play counts, but it's just not a business. Yeah. But it's, it's uh, the revenue that comes back from YouTube is abysmal. And at some point, I see this, all this work you're creating, a lot of it doesn't have sponsors. And I just think how, what's the strategy here? Where's this thing going? Well, yeah, I mean, I think what would be, so I think for, let's just, let's just dive into that for a second on, on your point of view. I mean, it's sort of like, I mean, you do, you, you, when you guys create all the content that you do, cause you do great stuff. I mean, whether it's stab in the dark and stab high and all the different things that you do, you know, from your point of view, I mean, do you see, do you see, um, lower CPMs on a volume basis, or would you rather see higher CPMs on a more high traffic basis? I mean, cause you, cause you can do it one or two ways. You can go for, you can go for frequency or you can go for big bang. Well, I just, if you, I think gaming traffic and gaming play counts is really simple. And I just think, uh, I don't think traffic is, I don't think traffic is truly your audience. I don't think traffic builds a brand. So it's, it's sort of finding that fine line. Yeah. And I, and I think, um, you know, one of the things that we don't want to do much like you is I don't think we want to like game the traffic. That's really not what we're, we're here to do. What, you know, what we're trying to do is establish a voice, uh, establish a narrative around the brand uh, of what we are with the WSL. Um, I also think an important thing is, is much like with you, you know, trying to become a habit. You know, I think one of the things that's great is, you know, when, you're, when your brand can become habitual, um, that's when you get this evergreen traffic and you don't have to game traffic to your point. Yeah. Okay. And so what is the, I guess it's, it's been a pretty short tenure there so far, but what have you been most proud of in this period? We work at WSL. Um, well, there's a couple of things I would look at. I mean, I, I think, you know, when you look at, I've been there for about a year plus, not, not counting this, uh, you know, including the CEO side of thing. A sure. couple, one is the, the, you sort of talked about it, which was this great increase of content that sort of happened. You know, we did that with the existing infrastructure and people that were there. I mean, we've got such great, um, leaders of teams. I mean, obviously, you know, you know, most of them. I mean, I think Dave's gifts that he has, Proden, um, you know, has really been great from a brand perspective. Uh, Tim Greenberg, uh, who really has helped lead a lot of the production uh, has gone along the way. And we have all of these great assets that were looking to be deployed from a vision perspective. So I'm really proud of how the team sort of like adopted a new content philosophy and really leaned into this other 300 idea that we've often talked about, Sam, that is like, okay, sports league, now we're gonna build this media company wrapped around. Um, I'm probably the most happy about that. Um, from like a singular thing, um, I, think, I think getting Ultimate Surfer created and launched and sold to a major television network um, in the United States. Um, I don't know if your listeners will appreciate just how hard that really is and just how rare that is. Um, granted, it's not been taped yet because of COVID and granted it's not on the air yet, so it's a little too early to unpop the champagne. Um, but as of even at the call yesterday, I mean, it's still on, it's, we're, we're ready to go. We've got contingent dates sort of built. Um, when that happens, that's gonna be a very proud moment. And so that will be pushed back to 2021, obviously. Yeah, we're, I think, I, d I don't know is the answer. Um, I think right. the, ne the networks all have some really significant challenges with their fall schedules um, because the entire town, Hollywood is completely shut down right now. Um, but we've got, we've got holds on different places and, and times that we could actually do these events, uh, tape them. Um, the other thing to remember is that the great thing about Surf Ranch, it's a private facility. So it can, we can 
really get this thing sort of locked down and controlled to actually shoot it, even with the right protocols that we need to do. So um, I think we just, we're going to get it shot and then we're going to be working with the network on when they want to put it on. Yeah, closed set. You don't have to worry about swell, tides. It's, uh, it solves a lot of problems and you can just, you can sit on it. You can, you can, you can have all the, the pre-production done and it's ready to go at a certain time, which is so rare for us in surfing. That makes it, that's the most difficult part of this whole thing. Totally. It's made it, made it waiting for a tennis court to be in good form for a game. Like it just, it's the number, the, the number of complexities around running a surfing contest is just astronomical. Yeah. And that, and, and again, let's add to that sentence the number of complexities running an international surf contest without a global pandemic was insurmountable. Now imagine trying to figure out how to do, <laughs> how to do it right now. So yeah, it's been, uh, so anyway, so that's how the first four months is going, Sam. That's it. There you go. Wow. Yeah. That's super impressive. And then, so where do you see the league going? Like, where do you see, what's your vision for it? Say what, what does it look like in 2025? Well, you know, I, I, a couple of things. One is I, I think we, I certainly believe we're going to have very healthy profit products and properties. You know, I look at the competitive side of our sport. I mean, you know, having the best surfers surf the best waves and the crowning of our world champions is, is, is the most important thing we do as an organization. Everything flows from there. You know, that's why it's a sports league in the middle and the media company wrapped around it. Um, but I think when you look at it, we got to get the products really, really tight and we got to get them very competitive. And I think um, that's why some of the other announcements today, in addition to the championships being awarded in the water, are important. Um, I think this modification from a seasonality point of view, from a challenger series, uh, is actually really significant. Um, strengthening the challenger series is going to strengthen the CT Tour. Um, the pathway to pro uh, really helps. Um, we have to make sure we've got young, vibrant, great, talent coming to really put pressure on the top tier of our sport. Um, and I think what the Challenger Series does, and then further down the line when we talk about the regional side, in 2025, I see all three of those products really dialed in and tight and locked and uh, clearly defined and really feeding off this tremendous competitive ecosystem. When that happens, this whole media company aspect that's wrapped around it really sort of ignites from that because the storylines that shoot out of there, the, the people who can't qualify, who do qualify, or the young kid that you've never heard of from wherever through a regional tour comes and shocks the world on the Challenger Series. And I think all of those narratives really become much more rich. So, you know, 2025 to me really looks like you've got a a, a solid competitive product and you've got a way that all these narratives really come to life. With so many various heads competing, is it, can you follow this human stories? Because it's really hard to engage in 30 or 40 or 50, 60 stories. Yeah. Look, I mean, it, it, you know, I'll share with you uh, a really, we've got a couple of really cool um, shows underway. I think you, you guys probably reported on it, but if not, um, um, we, we talked about this deal that we had um, with this company called Box to Box, um, which was, they did that uh, season F1 drive to survive. So we've, we've been in the market even pre COVID talking a bit about, um, you know, a version of that for the world surf league. So they, they, they were approached by every sport out there. Um, and, and they, they said, Hey, you know what, we're going to do surfing because number one, you guys go to the most beautiful places on the planet. Number two, you know, you guys are like dealing with mother nature. Number three, almost everybody, and I'll, I'll, I don't want to say everybody, but I'll say almost, and I'll let you decide who the other ones are. Some of the most beautiful, best looking people, you know, on the world, you know, are surfing these things and you're traveling around. And so the storylines are sort of great. So when we were developing the show, it was really interesting. They, it was hearing these, these, these networks and these partners that we have in town really sort of playing back to us, you know, the narratives. And, and the way I'd answer your question is, one of the things I've learned of being a storyteller most of my life in the content space is the compelling stories will always come to you. You don't have to go looking for them. And you know, you guys know this stab too. It's like, you guys will make 50 things, 
you know pretty quickly when you're making them, it's like these are the four that really matter. And of those four, this one is gonna be the one that really sort of drives it. And part of, part of our, our evolution as an organization is really identifying where those stories are and how they sort of bear more fruit. So, you know, whether or not it's the, you know, the real life story of, 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 of the struggle that a young surfer has to get on tour or the real life consequences for somebody on the CT tour that if they don't requalify has to go get a job. So, you know, those, those are the stories that really sort of connect in addition to what's happening in Steph Gilmore's life, what's happening in Gabriel Medina's life and how are they living? I mean, we're, we're all fascinated with stars. I think the gold, frankly, is gonna be the human stories. The, and I always say when we make content, the viewer has to see themselves on the screen. The more we can mirror back where people are, the better we're gonna be as storytellers. Agreed. And I think the scope and the storytelling that you will have on the Big Wave Tour, I think is, that's an area that I think will just grow and grow, especially the fact that you send guys out to Nazare. Like that is just, uh, I think that event, it, it blows my mind. I hope you have good insurance because I just, I, <laughs> I think it's, I can't yeah. even find the words. That, that just, watching that event, I just can't believe no one's died there. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, and you've seen, I'm sure, the footage. I mean, Kai Lenny has got some of the most amazing footage from that day. I saw something recently with like a GoPro in his helmet. The size of that barrel cave that he was in, in Nazare, was, I, I, don't even, I don't even know what to say what that was. That was like, not real, but it was real. But it was just, it was unbelievable. Extraordinary vision. Oh, extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary. Yeah, it's, um, but, you know, I think that part of what we can do as an organization is create a platform that encourages and, and promotes more narratives like that. I mean, I don't think it just has to be one time. I mean, that was a tow event. You know, and, you know, it was it was a lot of vision that Pat put together to put that event together. And I think that, you know, that we, if we weren't towing that day, we probably weren't running that day for sure. You know, and so, you know, it was exciting and compelling to watch. OK, one more question before I let you go. And I appreciate your time. Well, of course, no uh, worries. The the move to pay-per-view and trying to monetize your audience, are you focused on these distribution deals or you think this might be the future for you guys? Um, it's always a conversation to be really honest with you. Um, and I think that as you grow an organization, one of the questions you always ask yourself is, you know, who, who can monetize the audience more effectively or better? Um, in our case, that's the question that we're consistently asking ourselves. So you say, okay, um, you know, do you want to do a larger exclusive rights deal? Do you want to do make it more free based and grow the reach of the organization and make it an ad model? Do you want to get a core nucleus and, and introduce a paywall and charge a premium with no ads and monetize it that way? Is it a combination of the three? So we, we, I think that's a constant conversation that we've had as an organization as long as I've been there, uh, dating back over a year now. I think coming out of the pandemic, though, really just growing the sport and growing the reach really is the priority. Um, that's where you know my focus was last year when I was doing the distribution deals, which was really focusing on how we grow the sport. And, and again, some of the deals that unfortunately we didn't get to uncork this year, but we announced in the first part of this year is you know we had a deal with Channel Seven in Australia. As you know, I mean that's that's not a small that's not a small distribution deal. That's fairly substantial. And in addition to Fox. So, you know, that was really where the focus has been. And that's probably where the focus is going to be in the near term. As other products sort of come to fruition, we just will ask ourselves a question. Are we in a better situation to monetize it ourselves? Or should we basically partner with the media outlets? So um, I think it's too early to tell definitively what we'll do. But it's a constant discussion we have. Yeah, it's a challenge of saying, okay, how big is too big? I, mean, I guess the challenge is, you get to a point where we're, we're this size, but until there's the monetization of that audience, you, you are quite vulnerable because you just got to, you, you're chasing someone else for that support. But I guess the distribution does shore that up as it opposed does. to just chasing advertising. It does. It does. And, and, and I think to your point, there's going to be an inflection point, you know, where 
you, you're only going to be able to grow to a certain point and then how you monetize that point will become, you're, you'll exhaust that out. I think we've got a ways to go before we get there, uh, candidly. Um, and so that's part of the reason why taking advantage of, you know, uh, all the content that we're making now, increasing the platform's capabilities today to distribute it out as a, as a publishing platform, um, Ultimate Surfer, the Olympics forthcoming, some of these moments that we're talking about, all of these notes in this symphony that we have, I think really point us into a direction of like, okay, this is really going to help our audience growth and distribution. Once you get all the way through that and get to the other side of that, you'll see a normalization of the audience. And I think at that point is when you start asking yourself the question, okay, have we undervalued it, overvalued it from an economic point of view? And should we put up a paywall? And if you do put up a paywall, there could be different aspects and avenues. You know, much like with you guys, you know, you guys do certain pay-per-view events, you know, um, you know and, have, and have attempted to do some of those in the past. Is that something we could do for sure? I mean, um, it's not, it's something imminent, but it's something we've talked about. Yeah, I think it'll be a lot easier for all of us to do it if we all sort of head in that direction. Yeah. Uh, because there's just an education process. Yeah. But, and uh, the, expense of, the expense of it, though, I mean, as you know, it's like, you know, it, it gets to be, it's, it's always challenging when you have a free product. And then you have people, it's a, to, un, to unsell free is a hard proposition. It really Absolutely. is. Absolutely. And it's very risky. And, it, and it, uh, oftentimes a lot of people are like, hey, just put the paywall up. And okay, I mean, sure, you can do that. But there is, there is a dark side to that moon as well. And you only get one bite of the cherry. You can't go back after that. It's really tough. It's really tough. Yeah. It's really tough. Well, thank you for your time, Eric. I also wanted to say... Uh, I know in these times when everyone's sort of fighting to keep their business alive, doing things like you guys have done with the Stay Local program, I think it's super impressive. And uh, I wish you guys all the best this year. Thank you. Yeah, that's we're, we're you know, listen, it's, it's, we love supporting. It's an important thing to do. Um, you know, it, this, is, um, this is a really hard time for the industry. Um, you know, a lot of us have, have lost a lot of friends who have lost jobs and, um, you know, our, our intention with our organization is to try to be a platform that reminds people and tries to connect communities. Um, so I think that's an important thing for us to continue to do. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're happy to do it. And, um, you know, I do think, you know, we're going to be surfing sooner than later. Um, I don't think this is a forever situation. Um, the number one question that you didn't ask me was when. So, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, sooner than later, Sam, how about that? And I'm using later, that time horizon is 40 years. So how about that? <laughs> yeah, everyone expects you to have all the answers. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it is funny. I will say my phone rings a couple times a day from some, un, some, pe some people that you would know of very well asking me when we're surfing. And, and I try to politely just say, hey, have you turned on CNN or BBC or any news outlet anywhere? So You're a connection to the big end of town. Everyone thinks you have the answers. I, I, listen, I, I, I am un, unfortunately or happy to promote that I don't have many answers. <laughs> well, uh, thanks again. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for listening to Stab Mike, Stab's semi-irregular audible offering. And thank you to Dave Prodan from the WSL for helping to line up this interview. Mikey Ceramella and Stace Galbraith will have an episode of Cusp breaking down some of the proposed changes and looking at what those mean for both fans and surfers on tour. Look out for that later this afternoon.